focuscompounding.com or reach out to me uh, via email, andrew at focuscompounding.com. So in today's podcast, we are going to go over some 13 Fs. So once a certain fund or investment company is over a certain size, you have to file with the SEC your um, uh, US registered stocks that trade on an exchange. Mm -hmm. And that filing is called a 13F. And I thought it would be fun to kind of poke through a couple of them and see if there's a theme or a style or something that, you know, sticks out to us and just kind of pop them in quick FS and, you know, just see what people are buying nowadays. Now, of course, this is of the end of Q4. And as we record this on Mm -hmm. February 22nd, the fourth year anniversary of our podcast. Okay. Did you remember that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Um, uh, a lot probably has changed with these companies, presumably. I mean, this is, you know, markets have been changing and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So this is not just like, a, oh, this is what their uh, portfolio is. And of course, if they own international stocks, they don't go on these filings. If uh, these stocks don't trade on a major exchange, if they trade over the counter, stuff like that, they also don't go on the filings. Right. International, um, if they bought the ADR, shows up. Yeah, but mm-hmm. not if they don't. Yeah. Um, so, are there any 13Fs that you kind of keep an eye out for every single quarter? I read the Data Roma stuff of uh, anything uh, that they have. Are yeah. there any in particular, like anyone that you like to read about? Mm, not really. I mean, some matter more because they hold for longer, uh, take bigger stakes, things like that. So, they're more concentrated. I mostly focus on the ones if they buy into an industry that maybe I should look at that industry or something like that. So, I think like Glenn Greenberg. Um, would be one of those, um, you know, who else? Um, Tom Russo, a few different ones and those sorts of things who are mainly mm, probably buying because of the business mm-hmm. more so than the stock price or just the stock price. Um, they tend to concentrate a lot on particular industries at a particular time. Uh, Tom Russo mainly focuses on the same industries all the time. Uh, so then the other ones that are more like driven by valuation and stuff, um less so you said glenn greenberg yeah that'd be one he runs 3.1 billion dollars of what's on this 13f yeah probably this is probably pretty representative of what he holds i think because of what they focus on um which is like us and somewhat bigger Mm -hmm. you know companies um so you focus in certain industries you can tell overwhelmingly focused in financial stuff right now Mm mm-hmm yeah. So that's something that you try to take away. I mean, I mean, we're the not big addition up- is the title insurer. So like that's not new. This 13F isn't new. They, you know, it says reduce one point whatever percent. Mm-hmm. But that position was nothing. You know, less than a year ago or something. I, it, you can see the history sometimes on some of them. Um, and so that was a big change. Uh, you know, many of the others haven't changed quite as much. Can you take? Like, do you kind of look at it as, okay, we're probably not going to invest in like a progressive, I mean, we're definitely not going to with what we focus on and say, well, maybe this is an interesting industry to focus on in my pocket of the market. Is that typically how you go about doing this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, You know, some of these are hard because they're not really smaller examples of it. But, you know, he's in different kinds of insurance. Um health things, brokerage, uh, focus on a lot. Like his concentration levels are very high compared to what would be suggested by the stocks alone because they're highly concentrated by being the same sort of business model in the same sort of industry. So there's very little in there that isn't uh, financial or healthcare type stuff. There's like Valvoline. Mm -hmm. Um, There's not a lot else, yeah. And he used to be big in like telecom stuff or whatever, you know, so completely different at different times. Thought we could look at uh, Berkshires, mm-hmm. and we one thing I actually, there, right? Yeah, one thing that I thought was interesting. Where did I read it earlier? I was reading this. Um, Warren Buffett wrote a letter to a bunch of reporters yeah. about the Activision did you read the letter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's what I meant. That was the edition was um, <laughs> Activision. They bought about a billion dollars worth of Activision. One of his managers um, before after the scandal broke. Uh, that the Wall Street Journal reported on and stuff, but before um, there were any negotiations to uh, buy the company. 
Yeah. So for people that aren't familiar with it, basically one of the investment managers, Todd or Ted, he wouldn't specify, which is usual, uh, bought into Activision in October, I believe. Let's see. He said he bought 80% or something. Yeah, 85% of his 85. position in October, finishing his purchases in November. His average cost was about $77. He said, to sum up the facts, it was about three months after our manager's first purchase that Microsoft announced its acquisition proposal of which Berkshire had no prior knowledge. When Microsoft files its proxy material on its proposed purchase of Activision, I would be surprised if they had even discussed a proposal with Activision in early October, although yeah, I that. don't know. Yeah, we, we know that from media reports. Uh -huh. Unless the media reports are wrong, the discussions didn't begin before then. Something I thought was interesting, he goes on to talk a little bit more about it, and he said, I'm posting this letter on Berkshire's website to clear up any misinformation you or other readers of the journal piece may have ingested before its correction and in order to have the record correct after I am not around. Mm -hmm. And then just warn E. Buffett. No, sincerely, not that just warn E. Buffett. Mm -hmm. Basically saying, F you guys. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it was a misreported sort of thing. The insinuation was that somehow they might have known about this or something like that. And the reason why that happened, it, basically the headlines were just like, Berkshire buys a billion dollars of Activision, you know, right before deals like, announced. Or weird, he's best friends with Bill Gates. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so they corrected the story. Uh, the Wall Street Journal corrected the story, but it had already been picked up in other places. And so, of course, picked up all over the internet, mm -hmm. duplicates it everywhere, you know. And those will never be corrected and people will just hear that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But also interesting is that there's not much benefit to it. They talked about it and it was f interesting because, you know, I read some articles where they say how much they would make if the deal closes at that price. But they didn't talk about how you could buy, what price you could buy at after the deal was announced. Mm -hmm. Like in this case, there have been times after the deal was announced where there's not much benefit at all to if you had bought before the deal because there's been such a widespread, right? Because it's what, $95 deal? Yeah, but it's traded at very close to seventy-seven dollars after the deal has been announced. At times, when we recorded, I believe that's what it was around, wasn't it? Yeah, it might have been. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he added thirty-three percent to Chevron. Okay, and, and I don't know who this, that is. Yeah, is it yeah. this Berkshire? But it could be that's, Ted Todd. That would seem most likely Buffett. I thought that would be Buffett. My too. guess is Chevron yeah. is Buffett. My guess is Verizon Liberty is Buffett. Like Liberty, or like obviously, I think that would probably be like. Ted. Yeah. No, I, th I think once you get down to, let's say, okay, probably, no, even higher than that, I was going to say. Yeah, let's see. Um, hmm. I don't know how much is anyone else. So if you're, you should go watch the video of this because it's going to be hard to follow otherwise. But if you see, they have Bank of New York, right? Bank of New York Mellon? Yeah. Yeah. So from Bank of New York Mellon up, it's very likely that that stuff is not people who aren't Buffett. Uh, they might both own it. You know, Buffett could own it. Someone else could own it. Char Charter Communications, Snowflake, Amazon. Those are not Buffett. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Buffett's not GM, I'm going to guess. He's definitely not Vita. Um, I don't think he's Kroger, you know. So unless he's buying something, if you see below that, if he, Buffett himself is buying it, uh, it would only happen because he started buying it like before the quarter ended or something. He wouldn't want to have a position that small, mm -hmm. you know. So, let, how much are Ted and Todd managing each now? More they started seven, with, close to ten. I was gonna say ten. Ten. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, if you look at some of those, let's say, uh, so what? How about Davida? How much is that listed as? That's four. What does it say the value is over there? Four billion. Uh, there we go. 4.1 billion. Yeah. yeah. So if they're managing 12 billion or whatever now, I don't know how much they're managing. Um, you know, that's reasonably large and they're pretty concentrated investors historically based on what we know of them. So that kind of thing makes sense. Um, so those could be big positions for them as opposed to, I would assume like Verizon is a tiny Buffett position. I don't mm -hmm. know that for a fact, but I would assume Verizon is a Bank very of America, small. American Express, those are Buffett. We know that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Obviously know that Moody's. We know that the first ones that are the Verizon U S bank or Chevron Chevron that matches Buffett more than anyone else. Definitely. But look at this Apple position. 47% of his portfolio right now. Yeah, that doesn't capture everything that Berkshire owns, but yes. Mm -hmm. As it mainly doesn't capture the fact that they have cash that could be in investments. 
because Berkshire doesn't run things like a fund where it's trying to have 0% cash. So it has a lot in cash. I mean, if you actually broke it down the way a fund would, you know, to its own investors, mm -hmm. it would have a huge cash position. It would say common stocks, you know, whatever. So Apple, Apple would be like not a 40, not on almost 50% position, but maybe like a 30% type position, 30 something percent type position and cash would be a huge number. What do you think these are? These SPY positions <laughs> and Vanguard S&P, like what, what are those? <laughs> That are 0, 0.0 whatever yeah. percent. I don't think it's worth worrying about. I know, but like, why does he have 18 million in this and in, in Vanguard and stuff like that? I don't know. So I believe, so um, they also manage some pension assets too. I don't know if these are accidental type things that they are holding for a time um, because of something else. I remember also we don't see short things. I have no idea if there's something you know that has to do with time or something like that i mean those are very very small amounts they're totally insignificant um so uh like wells fargo right is they try to sell everything but some still held there mm -hmm. that's probably some kind i mean he wouldn't still hold it so i don't know if it's combining different things on their 13f that are actually held in other uh that aren't that they wouldn't consider part of the investment portfolio i would guess none of that stuff you're seeing down there below um hmm. i would say nothing below hmm, i don't know most of the stuff even much below what is that liberty media mm -hmm. um formula yeah that's a formula one yeah yeah most of the stuff below that i'm not even sure if it's really held by the company uh, because some of them are were big positions that Berkshire had, but why would they have almost none of it still owned unless it was inside of something that's counted for the 13F? So why is Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, um, Wells Fargo on there? See, they didn't change them. So probably they bought them in something else at the same time that they had bought them as actual investments, and then they didn't um, sell them off. Now, Procter & Gamble, Buffett, that's not really buying it. He got it because of Gillette merging into it but let's look at um lee lu yeah so this probably is very unrepresentative because he basically invests in china yeah the one thing though that stood out to me was that he added uh to his facebook position mm -hmm. uh 53 yeah and i guess a, useful a lot of thing, people have been buying facebook it seems like yeah uh, you mean in value investors and stuff yeah because the same number are selling is buying um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if the same number of people, but the same number of shares. Um, so uh, reported price, you can look at that to get an idea. So you know, th we the last time that they have a price is when they filed this thing. So it's a little confusing. We don't know that he bought it. That you have to click on it to see more about like when he bought and with average prices and history and all that. But you can see if the price is down a lot or whatever. So from the reported price or up. So he added a lot. Um, in the fourth quarter of 2021 and the reported price at the end of that was, uh, how does that compare to the price today? Let's see where Facebook, or Meta. Meta platforms, $206. Yeah, so it's calculating there for you if you look at Lee Lu's page on Dataroma. Uh, it calculates the difference. So it shows you that it's down almost 40% or something. Yeah. Right. They're 9.96. Yeah. So you can see that to get an idea of the difference. Now that's not the difference though, from where you bought necessarily, but it's the difference from the last quarter that has the reported price. So it's that's sometimes important because, um, if you see a really big difference, I've looked at some that are kind of shocking. Um, then they might not be buyers or sellers at today's price you know like if they stopped buying mm -hmm. and then the stock is down 30 percent the last quarter they may have started again or you know vice versa if it's been going up a lot in price got it let's look at a few norbert Liu. so like that's someone that i always like to see just because he makes his purchases are so mm -hmm. few and far between very concentrated investor and that's typically what his 13f looks like yep. much berkshire no change. Ally Financial. And, Which is uh, that for a while. Yeah, Winnebago Industries. Yeah. No more NVR. I wonder when he sold out of NVR. I don't know. Three stocks, yeah. Uh-huh. But Monish. again, we don't know if he's in other stuff. Yeah, uh-huh. And Monish. that's why this is like, everyone always uses Monish actually as like an example of yeah, his, his 13F and it's actually, I mean, how much of it's in India and overseas. 
Yeah, and uh, uh, do we know that he bought the um uh that we know he's bought some stuff, right? So he's like ADRs. probably indirectly bought ten cent. Yeah, because he's bought. Do we know this or not? He's spoken about ten cent. I know he bought Baba, sold it. My guess spoke is about sold, ten cent. He's probably sold all the Baba to buy ten cent indirectly through another vehicle that exists that owns a ten cent stake. That's a major asset is a ten cent stake, but it's a foreign company, so it wouldn't appear on the ADR. So that would be my best guess is what mm. he probably did, but I don't know that. So it makes it look like he just sold out of Alibaba. I mean, he did in the last quarter, but to people following this, they might think he just sold out of that. Um, yeah, everyone's favorite stock. I was going to say, why do people love Micron so much? So, I mean, very cheap, uh, often. Well, they love NVIDIA too, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, Micron is incredibly cheap uh, at times in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you think that there's any decrease in cyclicality over time. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of I don't see it. cyclicality, though, in, this, yeah. in the return of S capital. And everything. we know that there is a shortage right now. Sure. So, I mean, the issue here is, you know, that's just difference. Why, you know, it's a giant stock, so we want to buy it anyway. But some of these stocks that are very popular um, and look like value stocks, I would, wouldn't be interested in because of the cyclicality suggests that they're not really very cheap i mean when you adjust for the fact of where we are in the cycle so like um is it more so of a trade though because doesn't everybody because sometimes you come across these true, companies it's the wrong part of the cycle to buy if it was a trade this is the worst time yeah. to trade it. well that's my point sometimes you see these cyclical companies that are showing like two to three times earnings and because to your point that's like the wrong time to buy into these right what was it in 20 when it bottomed out the return on investment cap bottom on 2015 or something. Yeah. Let's, let's see. What was the P or what? Well, well, let's start with, let's start. Yeah. Let's what were earnings in 2015? 2015 EPS, $2 and 47 cents, 2.9 billion. Okay. 2016 uh, earnings were nothing, nothing. They lost money. Right. And then two years later, they made um, <sighs> six, <laughs> 14 point one billion. So I'm trying to figure that out. Yeah, they made over six six D six zero times um their the earlier period. So you got a sixty X in earnings in like two years, which is normal because the cycle is about maybe it's eighteen months, maybe it's twenty four months. So like it extends sometimes. I mean, it's like when we talk about cycles in the economy overall, but it's a very short cycle stock. You can see that in the results. So if you buy at a peak like that, see, it went from net income of 14 billion to 2 billion also in about two years. So it probably is, I mean, two years is probably pretty accurate as to what the cycle would be normally in this industry. So if you buy at the bottom of a cycle, then within two years, you'd be selling if your point is to buy and sell on that. Now, some people may think that the cycle has changed, you know, that's not cyclical in the same way anymore. The issue, though, is over very long periods of time, historically, the company hasn't really earned very good returns on capital and built a lot of value. Um, if you look back over 20, 30 years, um, that's just generally been the case mm -hmm. because there's so many years where there's not they're not short, um, but supply isn't short, and you don't make money when supply isn't short. You can look at it, though. I mean, the market cap went from $17 billion to $60 billion on that zero to $16 billion in earnings. Mm -hmm. From 16 to 18. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. Let's look at like margins. Um, so the big change that you have is pricing. So gross margins. And so that drives what you're seeing in the operating margin results, obviously. So for instance, operating uh, margin increased, you know, went from what, 2% to 20% in five years or something. Yeah. But gross margin at the same time increased by almost the same amount. Um, there's a slight difference, but very, very little. In fact, if you look at like EBITDA and stuff, you probably there wasn't a difference. So basically, it's differences in pricing. So, I mean, to me, these are like oil. I mean, it's very short cycle. But to me, a lot of this stuff, a lot of the, a lot of silicon stuff is basically oil. It's modern day for the economy, uh, the raw material. 
that you're getting and you have similar patterns in terms of it's completely critical that you need it. Um, it grows over time, but it doesn't make money. It doesn't make very good returns on capital except when it's in short supply. And then when it is, it makes a lot. Um, now the cycle is very, very short in these technology things. Um, very short, probably like we said, two years or something from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas it's long in oil, you know? Yeah. Everyone loves, everyone loves Micron. Michael Burry, what's he up to nowadays? Managing 74 million, assuming this is his entire book, uh, which we probably shouldn't make that assumption. Um, uh, let's and see. then why does he have to file? Yeah, why does he have to file? I don't know all the rules and when it dropped below 74 and all that and who knows. Yeah, that's a good point. Because you shouldn't have to file unless you have 100 million of 13F securities. No GameStop on here. When, yeah, when was the last time you owned GameStop? Probably a long time ago, right? Uh -huh. He's very active. Very active. <laughs> Sometimes you look, he does a lot of stuff with like options, calls. Who knows what he's doing? Yeah, I have no idea how you could get anything useful from him. Um, maybe you could in like what specifically he's speculating on them. But if you look what his turnover in this portfolio is like 85, 90% in a quarter. So 300. What do you, I mean, how would you even describe his investing style? I don't know his investing style. I don't even, I don't know it either. <laughs> like, I mean, looking at it, I mean, if you read some of his old stuff, he came from mm -hmm. Graham and Doddsville. But very different from that. Very deep value. Short term speculative, big upside. How do I get a big upside? You know, Graham wasn't like that. Um, using Graham and Dodd type metrics, because like using price to book and stuff, sure. But focusing on things where you have big changes in the underlying business, where you might get results fast, you know, things like that. Uh, very different. He's not following a Walter Schloss uh, type approach. Also, not widely diversified and not low turnover. And a lot of the companies, aren't particularly high uh, like they don't all have particularly good credit or things like that and they're not intended to be held as long as Graham would hold things yeah i'm looking at it looks like last time he filed the 13f with gme on there was q3 of 2020 which okay. also coincidentally was peak portfolio value of 154 million okay yeah so i don't know how to get anything um from what he does yeah and I don't even know if he's doing lots of stuff that's not captured by that. You know, who knows? Like you said, it could be option stuff. It could be short stuff and mm -hmm. long other stuff, and you're not seeing all of it. So Super Investor Portfolio Stats mm -hmm. says top 10 buys last quarter. Amazon, Visa, MasterCard, Facebook, Comcast, Alibaba, Fiserv, PayPal, GM, Salesforce. Uh, did you watch Munger speak at the Daily Journal meeting? I did, yeah. So a lot of questions on Alibaba. A lot of questions about Alibaba, yeah. And I even, it was kind of funny to me. I was like, uh, she probably does not want to be sitting there answering all these questions mm -hmm. um, about Alibaba. But do you have any thoughts on on uh, Alibaba since we've no. last talked about it? No thoughts on it. Is it pretty similar since when we last talked yeah, about it? Yeah, uh -huh. we talked about it like the end of 2021, I think. Yeah. Um, no, don't have a lot of thoughts about it. Uh, for the data Romo stuff, there, um, there are some, you notice like a lot of it is the same that you would see for major hedge funds and things like that. The one thing that they're definitely skewed a lot more towards is sort of, um, financial, uh, I guess you call it fintech. Um, but some of it's been around a very long time, but stuff that is related to processing, technology things, whatever, um, you see a lot of that in their uh, holdings. So even when you were saying about uh, PayPal, um, Visa, MasterCard, things like that, they're very big in those, mm -hmm. um, more so probably than, you know, the overall market where they're a little lighter on FANG. Um, it also, let's see, um, they also do things like tracking across the, uh, the most concentrated bets and things like that. Yeah. The top big bets. Yeah. Which gets skewed because it, it takes in like a few big holders. It used to be really skewed. Oh, they still have it. Fairholm is still counting here. It used to really be skewed by like Eddie Lampert and um, Bruce Berkowitz and stuff. Mm -hmm. And there might have been some other ones because it depends on what they track. 
Um, so it would show them like, I, you know, Eddie Lampert or whatever was showing Sears as a big thing, right? Which is like a, was a controlled company and stuff. Um, so the Micron one, yeah, there are a couple of people who are really big on Micron. Micron is that the most, that's the biggest, is that the biggest big bet that it has? Yeah, it's yeah. Well, number two on this one, yeah. Yeah. IEP, did you see uh, the documentary about no, Icon? No, I did not. Relentless Billionaire, you should watch it, it's actually pretty good. Okay. Yeah, so that's just showing up as a big bet because Icon, they follow. And so because the way the 13F is done, it shows that as an ownership thing and not instead showing through that. You know, it would be as if you're tracking Warren Buffett's personal portfolio and you say he's making a big bet on Berkshire Hathaway. Mm -hmm. You know. Let's see. David Einhorn, his number one position is still, as of this filing, Greenbrick Partners. For this past quarter, the thing that's more interesting to me is the reported price difference for all these ones we're looking at. So not what they've bought and sold so much as the fact of how big the changes have been for some of the stocks that they own. Yeah, we have uh, in the next podcast, there's a screenshot we're going to go over, which is the amount of, there's just a bunch of different stocks that are down just a yeah, huge I mean, amount from their 52 week high. This yeah. area. And that's not arbitrary. So, you know, the Playboy 52, group is actually on that list. <laughs> yeah. So the 52 week high thing is, uh, you know, very, I mean, it's not arbitrary. You've decided ahead of time you're going to use the 52 week high, but it, it's not very realistic that someone bought at the 52 week high and then is going to sell today at the time you're looking at it. Right. But the reported price thing is because it's just what the end of the quarter was. So these are just big declines since the end of the quarter. So that does give you a feel for how far down things are uh, in, and how in some of the, I was very surprised by it with some of these. Uh, you know, I don't want to like single out specific people and say, look at how far down. I mean, but there's some where it's like everything that they own is down more than 20% or something. Yeah. So he literally, I have this as a question that I wanted to make sure I didn't forget. Said, I'm, I mean, I'm before, reading for my before notes. Before the market went down 10% or whatever yeah. it's down now. There were people who literally like everything they own was down 20%. And that's because you're owning, they're clustered in very specific uh, technology. A lot of, it's technology without earnings is usually what they're yeah, clustered. Yeah, long duration companies. No earnings today and insane valuations. I mean, if you look at, now I guess this is not really a good example, but um, Sam, right? We've talked a lot about Okay. that company and how much that company has pulled back but a lot of that also was that they like the boston beer company they was it they uh they took a huge write-off huge impairment on something right right that they, did not pan pan off as well but i mean remember i mean how many times did we look at this company in 2020 and 2021 and even his sales was like i i think it's huge right i think it's interesting have yeah. you looked at it recently? I thought people were crazy to buy it in advance of uh, the spiked uh, seltzer type yeah, stuff. Yeah, uh -huh. we I think we talked a little bit about that, where that was my concern. Is it was that, like 40 or 50 times EBITDA at one but, point. But, you know, you read the, um, didn't you read uh, Quench Your Own Thirst or whatever? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can see in the history of the company, this is not unusual. I mean, I wrote it up one time and I was like, I didn't kind of didn't want to recommend it because I think the long-term history of the company is very good and it's a business that you'd want to own. But I don't think anyone will stay in the stock um because they each time this happens where you get a new category that gets big that they push into and then of course you have too much expansion into it too much competition then it comes down and everything but eventually you can settle out with them making good money in that category but everyone buys it for that reason you know that thing is now big mm -hmm. you know let's say it was uh cider or you know a while ago or whatever hard cider you know and then people buy it for that and for a few quarters you'd have amazing growth they also have a big issue that um people are focused on the financial results and not as much on the sell through which i will warn about with that is that you, if you see these companies financial results it's what they're selling into a channel that then takes a while to actually get sold by people you know to get consumed mm -hmm. and what you need to focus on in on is what you got to find data on how much you know hard seltzer is actually being consumed each month and not how much this company said in its quarterly results was sold because it's sold to someone who distributes it mm -hmm. who puts it on shelves and it's going to be a while before you realize that it's just sitting there on shelves not selling through and so a lot of their up and down that you see is like that they have a few years where they have negative growth and it's all destocking 
you know, so the inventory builds up too much in one year and then the next year they have to sell more of it. So they don't get reorders at the rate that they should. But if you followed how much consumption was, mm -hmm. they're almost every year, it's just a bit higher of the products that they're selling, yeah. So a lot of people are probably thinking, how do you keep up with that? Is there some sort of like industry yeah, report? There's industry data. Is it... I mean, even the company tries to give you as much data as they can, although it's somewhat out of date. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you can find out by looking at, at industry data on that. Um, and you want to look to make sure. I mean, what I'm saying is the issue is um, just understand that all of the overall financial results are not based on the sell through. So they're based on the company shipments and stuff. So I think people totally understand that and look at the data for how much is actually being consumed. But while doing that, you look at things like QuickFS and it says, this is what revenue growth was. Okay, but was revenue growth um, higher in this period than how much was actually being consumed? You know, that's what you have to pay attention to. So I don't doubt that everyone knows the obvious thing that you have to look at what's actually being consumed. But then I think they also, when making their estimates and stuff, use revenue and use um, earnings growth and all that, which are financial results, which are fine but they're not representing actual demand at the same level as when walmart says revenue grew this much people bought walmart's products mm -hmm. when this company says that distributors bought products to sell to distribute it through to p specific places where you can sell it in shops and then we'll see what happens with that in terms of on store shelves and everything same thing with celsius or any of those things um and so, you know, inventory growth is probably too high here. We could look at it. But this is all like obvious if you go to the stores and look at what was happening. So for instance, I think, I don't know all the details, but like um, ready to drink um, cocktails probably grew more and um, uh, hard seltzer stuff probably grew less in the last few, like quarter or a few quarters, just because that seems to be the trend you can see in life by being out there right now. Mm -hmm. And the companies probably had too much inventory of one thing, not enough of the other. Yeah, so inventory went up. Um, let's see. So we're on quarterly. So it's September. Yeah, so it's a seasonal thing. It was now. at yeah. 196 million, but yeah. it was down from 248 million. Yeah. Um, so you could see the build that you have there um, from before COVID through to the middle of last year mm -hmm. was very big inventory growth. Um, so if we look, let's see, COVID starts, where are we? Yeah, so it starts right there. Yeah, and then we have it jump, it doubles during COVID basically in those 18 months or so. And then it's come down since then. So do you, would you be interested in Sam at these levels or learning more about it? Learning more about it's it, just I guess, completely yeah. destroyed. We could look at it. It's not the first time in the company's history that's happened. I mean, if you look at a chart, you know, because it's not, um, because it's not a, um, you know, it's not a log chart. Um, it's going to make the prior drawdowns look a lot smaller. Sure. Because mm -hmm. the stock has been, you know, up and to the right for the all time uh, number. If you look at it, it'll make other. It's see, like, well, it's just so like, yeah. those don't look like anything when that happened, you yeah. know, um, back in some of those other periods. Yeah. The stock are incredibly expensive, right? You can see that. Uh, but where, where are we? We're back to just a little before COVID. How much before COVID? Where are we? Literally, like, here's COVID started. Like, here's December of 2019, January of 2020. Yeah, we're kind of like right there. Yeah, so I don't get it. I, I don't understand why this happens with people, but so the company sometimes grows 30% a year, quarter over quarter. Yeah. You know, year, year over year for a quarter or whatever. Well, they're and that pricing that in, right? So they're pricing that in for all time. Why did it? go up how much did it go up did the stock tri uh, triple three times yeah yeah so the stock tripled and then it came down by mm -hmm. that amount too we were in a lockdown situation more time to drink baby and it's certain categories they get even more excited because certain categories are growing fast and all of that what's the saying narrative follows price 
I guess. Price follow narrative, one of the two, but um yeah i mean they start to ju- i mean people start to justify it though so people were saying if you want to go back to 2020 well you're at home more you're drinking more well if you you can't do much other than meet up with people and drink right you could be so, uh, outside by a pool right and the huge issue is that some of these things may have been things that people do not drink out um and do drink at home yeah you're not going That's to a bar risk. you're not going to restaurants Right, but like the huge risk is, so take the seltzer example. So is that, we know what it tastes like, we know how convenient it is, we know where you can get it, and we know the alcohol level. It sounds like something that someone has in their hand at all times while home during COVID. And <laughs> yeah. it does not sound like something that they're ordering. Are you, are you talking about at, yourself or at, what? At, 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 Don't put that on other people, the, Jeff. They're ordering at high volume at a bar. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. So as soon as things open up, the drinks might get harder, right? They might get more expensive. They're sold through different distribution that you could have in different places on premises and stuff. So it completely changes the category Mm -hmm. that way, you know? Um, And that was a joke, guys. Jeff does not drink. That was a joke. (laughs) Um, If you go to compare and and put in the S&P, though, you can get the idea that I was trying to get at for it. You see the compare um, thing down there in the uh, upper left? There she is. Okay. And, you know, you can just click on it. You don't have to type it in. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. So there we go. So this is my point here, right? So how's the stock done over the full period versus the S&P? The stock is up 1,376 versus the S&P at 618%. Right. The S&P outperformed. And this is on all. On all years, which goes back in this case to the 90s? Yeah, 92. All right. Um, The stock underperformed for a period in the 90s, right? And you would have been ahead in the S&P 500 until probably around the dot-com boom or something, would you have started to get a, after the boom came down, you would have mm-hmm. started to get ahead in, in this. And then since then, as a long-term holding, this has been much better than uh, the S&P 500. Yeah, it's a good five-year. So the five-year Boston beer is down 138% versus 84%. You can look at the two-year. Up, oh, we're under. Yeah, we are under. But that's Negative COVID 4% right versus there on the far left, we can uh-huh. tell, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. And then year to date, just for fun. Uh, I think it's down. a long term predictable uh, company. It's a great. And I think it's great everything, right? Brand, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I think it doesn't attract Durable. the shareholder. It doesn't attract and keep the shareholder base it should have and has the wrong shareholder base for what it's in. But do you get the shareholders you deserve to quote Warren E. Buffett? I don't think that. I've read their communication in the past. I don't know what they were communicating this time and stuff, you know. They're certainly optimistic uh, as a company, but they gave you the information that you needed to be able to understand the industry over the long term. Um, You know, I don't get it, to be honest. Um, And if we look at the long term, like in the quick FS thing, we can look at things like revenue. uh, Let's do the annual and then maybe like key ratios or something like that. We could see the growth rates, right? So we can see growth. Yep. So we got year over year growth and things like revenue, gross profit. So it goes down sometimes because of um, the issues that I said. But on like a three year rolling basis, which is what I would use, you have a very predictable company here. You see, to me, this is what happened is that during COVID, you had this surge in revenue growth. And it was happening a little bit. It probably would have happened a little bit anyway without COVID. Um, that things would have gone up a little bit, but then it was really big. And if we can, we do quarterly so we can see this more. Yeah, I just think people were wanting to buy anything that was growing, you know, thirty percent a year. And they were growing for a little bit more than that. Hmm. I mean. Yeah, 30%, 42%, 30%, 53%, 65%. And the stock probably started dropping while it was still growing, Mm -hmm. you know, at whatever that number is, you know, 15 or 20% a year. Um, Because it went from 50% down to that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's one of those stocks, I think, as a business and everything, I think it's pretty attractive in the long run. Um, And... I think that the stock is too volatile and people don't stay in it. So it's hard for me to recommend on that basis. I mean, we, can we look at the business description to see what the share turnover is in this thing? 
503%. <laughs> so, you know, like well, people are like trading this thing. Yeah. It's created triple levered uh, the Boston Beer Company. Yeah. Um, ETF stock. So, and there was what, a $12 billion company or something at 1.15? Mm-hmm. Whatever. That is from the That market. was like what, peak EBITDA or peak EB to EBITDA. Yeah. What, um, so a company like this, right? If you were to do more due diligence and research on them, I mean, what are some things that you would be interested in? Uh, Just for the people that want to do that. I don't know that there's much research that I need to do on it that's different from um, stuff I already know about it. So would it really be just underwriting a return that you're comfortable with? Yeah, I mean, your 10-year average uh, EBIT. Now, gross profit in the most recent quarter was what, like 30% or something? It's dropped by a huge amount. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but normally, EBIT had been around 15%. So it, the stock would be um, cheap or normally priced compared to most stocks if it was trading about 1.5 times sales. So it's trading at a slight premium to like the long-term average of what stocks generally trade at. Um, another way of looking at it is the long-term free cash flow is 8% and it's two on the price to sales, right? So we're talking about around a 4% free cash flow yields about 25 times PE type thing. Not expensive compared to stocks today. This stock actually isn't trading at any sort of premium over stocks today, I'd say. Though it is trading at premium over the average stock in an average period. So it, there's a little bit extra um, price here. Uh, compared to other things. So I still would, I'd want, I'd probably want to buy it more at a level that's more consistent with mature um, beverage companies and stuff because I want a margin of safety and all that. Yeah, because my question is, I mean, how do you sort of handicap a COVID burst, which we do see in the numbers, versus what's a normalized figure going forward? And that's, I mean, we've, there's a lot of companies that you look at nowadays that, on a TTM basis, they may look pretty cheap. I mean, a good example, which we've used, is when we went over Lakeland Industries or Lake Industries, LAKE is the ticker. Okay. Well, they made over, um, before COVID, they made what? An EBIT of over 100 million mm -hmm. to 150 million? What is that? So 2000, yeah, 2015 was 156, was peak EBIT. Um, 2019, so going into COVID, was 146 million and then 2020 was 249 million. Yeah. So, you know, you're trading at 30, 40 times what your pre tax profits were before um, COVID happened, um, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. Though the stock was often expensive and justifiably so. I mean, what's the 10 year number here? They've increased revenue at 14% a year, EPS, mid double digit, right, type yeah, thing. Yeah, 16%. Yeah, and returns on equity and... Uh, 22%. Yeah. Return on capital, yeah, everything's Without like, right. using, I mean, return on assets is alone is like over 15%, it's 16% or something. And you can see there's very few years where they have a problem. There's That year there isn't even a real thing. It had to do with a recall. Um, so, yeah, it's a high quality company and, and a growing high quality company in a really good industry and everything. Mm -hmm. It's just it might still be expensive even after dropping that much because we're just back to where it was. I would have said it was just a wonderful company, but expensive if we're looking at 2018 or whatever, and we're at the same prices. Yeah. And that's the thing I'm seeing a lot of nowadays, you know, where there's all these charts of this company's off their 52 week high and stuff like that. Right. Mm -hmm. But then you look at like on an actual valuation basis, not anchoring to its prior 52 week high. And it's yeah. like, is it cheap? <laughs> yeah, we talked about this. You know? We talked about this before. I don't I, think it is. <laughs> I don't care what it's done versus fifty-two week low, fifty-two week high, all-time high, all-time low. Doesn't yeah. matter at all to me. I care about the price, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I, I'm not excited by something. I, I have no problem buying something that's at an all-time high if it's at a reasonable price. And we've done it before. We've bought things at all-time highs that are PEs of thirteen or something. That happens on some stocks, and those are the ones we probably would like to buy. Um, but if it was at a all-time low, that was also a P of 13, you know, I would, I would buy it. I mean, this company, if you get this company for 13 times earnings, you would buy it. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's the, I mean, adjusting though for COVID is hard. But I think overall they have benefited permanently from it, is my guess. 
because they have leading brands like a brand awareness that, type yeah. thing no 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 the, the, there are other brands that are see they report it and it's every it's a really big part of it for them but if you look at shelf space and what's going to happen they're going to be a very big player for a long time in categories that yes they're not going to grow that fast but they're new categories that they're one of the leaders in okay so shelf space though like stuff. what do you mean by that i mean i know what shelf space is but they're still going to be carried in a lot of places where their competitors will no longer be carried. Mm -hmm. You know how important that is? Go into any Whole Foods, and I've tried this mm -hmm. many times, and I mean, it <laughs> makes sense. Go into any Whole Foods and look at like what your eye level would be mm -hmm. if you're looking at a shelf. And Whole Foods is always kind of, if you're an average height individual, yeah. it's right there. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny, like little games and stuff like that, that supermarkets mm -hmm. and uh, companies like that play. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that there there's going to be less shelf space for certain things, but that they'll be a leader in what's left over. They they have a leading, they have one of the top one, two, three market share in a lot of categories that are probably going to grow a lot slower in the future. But it's another thing that they sell. They've just, diversified over time. I mean, just, but not for any one quarter, of course. That's the problem. You know, they're they're which may be part of the issue. Their growth is not very diversified. Like even if their their results over time from their earnings are diversified across a few different things that they sell now, they're much more diversified than they were at first when they were just a better beer company. Um, all that growth comes from like one category when something like this is exploding, you know? So, I mean, because if you think about it, some things inside the company were declining mm -hmm. at that same period. Sure. So yeah. the category growth was, you know, very, very high. It's just craft beer so damn competitive. It mm -hmm. seems like everybody and their brother and their father and their stepfather and their sister wants to start a, their own craft beer. Yeah, they've, you know, they've increased market share over time. I, I don't know what it's like. COVID's just changed things a lot. But in terms of beer, they had, they had increased it a bit all the time in terms of market share by volume and certainly by price. Um, now, I don't know if they had increasing market share of what we call craft beer or they just were able to increase it in the overall beer category because craft was taking share, you know. Um, they actually predate kind of the whole thing. They like started it. Yeah, they basically started First it. Mover. People don't consider it, it that way anymore, yeah. Yeah, they, they did. Uh, and it's a good book, Crunch Your Own Thirst. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to learn about the company. Yeah. But what it, what's I, his name? Jim Cook, right? No? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, I think that the stock is, you know, too volatile for people. I think it's hard for people to, like, how far down is it off of uh, that high? Know. So where's that high? High was, where are we at here? Call it 1,200. Okay. Ish, yeah. Um, and we're at 378 right now? Yeah, so I if you're down by two-thirds, let's say, or something like that, or we could just use, yeah, what's the year to date here? Down 24%. And Okay, and that's, it was already... Cut in half or something by then? Yeah, I mean, over a one-year basis, it's down 63%. Right, okay. So I don't think people realize it can be down 65% and be expensive. A stock like this could yeah. be down 70%. That's if crazy. this stock's down 70%, I'd still call it a bit expensive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah. Well, that's what, the, so what it, I'm saying it was right a little now. expensive, and then it tripled or quadrupled. Uh -huh. And that happens with stocks. Well, as soon as... Well, clearly, right? Like if <laughs> if if you're if a company's still growing top line and everything by I mean, we could look at the quarterly numbers, thirty-three and then fourteen percent, and it's just getting slaughtered. Mm -hmm. It's all that future growth that people were baking in. Right. Yeah. And this is not the worst example of that. Like I mentioned NVIDIA and stuff before. There's some that are more probably even more extreme in what's happened recently. But you know, that might make a little more sense. There Maybe there's stuff that's more long-term change in those categories than this. This one seems pretty obvious that COVID fueled a lot of it. My thing is, like, if you're going to go to a restaurant and sit down, are you going to order a a Sam, like a Boston beer, craft beer, or are you gonna just going to try, like, all these different craft beers? I mean, how many craft beers are there? I mean, have you, there's apps called tapped or whatever yeah whatever. i'm yeah. not a beer drinker but it's like why i mean there's just so many dang brands yes now sometimes there are fewer brands than you think because some of the brands are owned by very big beer companies um so that is one issue um yeah 
I mean, I, yes, I think that that's a hard place. That's where they started locally in bars um, to get distribution. But over time... And they were concentrated in like what? The Northeast? Yeah, in the Boston area. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Boston beer. But um, yeah. they... I, but, yeah. But, but, you know, a lot of those things are so you drink that other beer once. It's not as common that that's taking a lot of the beer that you're drinking at home over long periods of time uh, as much. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is somewhat competitive. Mm -hmm. But, you know, not it's not that competitive compared to most industries. I mean, I agree. It's way more competitive than it used to be. But if we look at market share changes over time and stuff, in these new categories, they change a lot. But if we're talking about beer... Um, no, it doesn't change a lot. You know, it really doesn't. Even like uh, Budweiser losing share over time, they're losing it very slowly. Mm -hmm. Very, you know, like most industries would love to have that slow a decline that you can know things are going in the wrong direction and it can take, you know, there can be 10 years of suffering through that. Um, so, you know, it, it doesn't change a whole lot compared to most industries, but it is, a, but you're right. It's a very competitive industry um, compared to like other food and beverage stuff. You know, there is more shifting of people's interests in it. I'm not sure that there's as much shifting in terms of their main brand that they drink at home and stuff, though. But you're right that, it, you know, in some situations in, in uh, bars and stuff. But I think that's a lot of um, trying. There's, there's a lot of sampling, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't know that, that there, there's a huge mix in terms of what people are drinking in uh, volume, that they're repeatedly drinking the same uh, brands, you know. Because I feel like wine's very much like that as well, where it's like you sample a lot of different things. Yeah. I mean, the order and the of price is actually like a signal yeah. of like quality. Yeah. And wine's more commoditized and the scale advantages of wine happen much, much earlier, except for marketing stuff. Um, you know, in terms of the order of the businesses, business quality, wine business is the worst, beer business is in the middle, and spirits is the best. And there's a variety of reasons for that. But one of the big reasons is economies of scale. You achieve most of the economies of scale in wine very, very early on. You have to be quite a bit bigger to enjoy all the economies of scale in beer and then really big to have them in spirits. So those are differences. And then there's also just the commodity aspect of it. Um, wine is sold a lot based on where it was grown, what grape it is, and like you said, signals about price and year um, have an effect on people, right? And then you get up to spirit and it's just sold on name. Mm -hmm. You could say we have the same process as this one. It's the same mash, whatever. And the one that has the better name um, can, you know, uh, command a very high price versus the other one. It's just interesting. Like we've talked a lot about Coca-Cola, Virgin Cola, stuff like that. And mm -hmm. um, like how habitual these companies are for some people. I mean, mm -hmm. why... Did like Soda Stream and Green Mountain, like why did those companies not be more successful? If you think about like Soda Stream, right? So you just pop in whatever flavor you want and it's going to make whatever drink you want. Something like that would take out all of the friction and the um, things that like the economies of scale needed to build out like different drinks and stuff like that. Like why did that stuff fail? Well, a few issues um that you can think of right away there one you have severe diseconomies of scale there you're telling someone to do something at their own home in tiny volume that obviously has to cost much more than doing it even at a restaurant situation or doing it in a bottling situation so mm -hmm. it's going to cost more right it's the same problem that like keurig has right so for the same sort of quality it costs more but you can offset that with convenience and stuff. And maybe you won't think too much about it, that you're actually spending a lot more on Keurig than you are by... Um, uh, I'm going to take a sip of my Starbucks. <laughs> by grinding and um, and brewing your own coffee and stuff like uh -huh. that. You know? But that convenience can work for you, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the other issue that I always have with all of those, but some have been really successful. I mean, you know, Keurig is really successful. But a lot of them also, unfortunately, have the fact that uh, others can just copy you. Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest issue. Like when people ask about Sam and all that, my point is, look, they've got distribution. So who's the most likely to be able to move into this category? The idea that someone like that, you know, like you're saying that, okay, someone comes up with a better craft beer or something. Okay. 
I don't know. It doesn't matter yeah, that much. Yeah, yeah. They, they can sell out to someone else. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, at this point, how much better would it have to be? How unique would it have to be? Yeah, you need to so much capital too. Distribution advantages, yeah. And so sometimes that means you have to acquire things though. But in general, once you have that in a lot of different points of distribution, then I think that you can broaden out that portfolio with the different things that we're talking about. And it's usually pretty easy for someone like Coke or whatever to copy what you're doing. Um, and then it's a question of like the differentiation, how much people want differentiation, um, how much customers want it and how much they don't. Um, for a lot of things, they do want some. Um, I like on-premises stuff. I think that that probably is harder to dominate um, for some for some alcohol things as opposed to supermarket. It'd be much easier to become dominant in like beer sales at a supermarket mm -hmm. than it would be to dominate in um, a bar. Got it. Cool. Well, we started with 13 Fs and we ended up talking about alcohol, which is the best part about doing these podcasts and being free form and just going wherever the wind takes us. Um, do you have any other thoughts before I give the wrap up? Uh, I read the book. Read the book. Yeah, actually, and I mean, I read all the annual reports before. I haven't read them recently, but when I wrote up the stock. Um, Is he still chairman? Yeah, I don't, I don't know the details about that. Um, let's see, if you go back, hmm, if we do the chart, let's do it to, can you type it in to do to 2015 or something like that? Yeah. 20, no, actually, you know what? Um, go back to like 2010. So, yeah, um, it is interesting. So 2010, call it around 45 and change a share. Yeah, it's interesting because like um, the stock was very volatile and stuff. I had written it up and all of that. It's had two uh, huge increases and decreases over that time. And it's been fine if you had bought it then and held it to now. I mean, all the numbers that we see, if you just could look at the business results, you know, are good yeah, over time. That this, way. I remember, would always come up on the Buffett Munger screen or on yes. Guru Focus, mm -hmm. like five stars predictable. Yep. Just if you look at the... The screen just green everywhere, <laughs> you know, because they color code things. Right. Yeah, I, like very high quality. I agree with that. Now, that isn't factoring in the volatility of the stock. I think the problem with this business for most investors is the stock. See, other investors in there with you, that's going to cause a problem. I just, it's really hard if you think it's sort of expensive, like say a little expensive, but it's going to work out for me okay before COVID. Then you see it go up three or four times you're probably going to get at some point during that process, you're going to sell out of it. Now you'd say, okay, well you make a good profit on it. If something crazy like this happens. Yeah. But you're not going to get back in the stock. Probably not a lot of people sell it midway through. So it goes up, you know, three or four times. You probably sold it when it's up 50% or hundred percent, if you're a value investor in this. And then when it comes back down all this way, are you really going to buy back into it and then hold it? So you're going to spend a lot of time out of the stock with these wild swings in it. Mm-hmm. I think of it as a good thing for the long term, but the volatility I think is just so high that it's hard for investors to stick with it. So I think that ends up that they more replicate other people's decisions, which is buying, um, you know, based on valuation, they might buy it um, and then try to sell it, you know, when it has any of these runs. But these have been, I mean, they look so small now, but you know that like before COVID, some of those peaks were not small moves. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, yeah, they, but you're they right, disappear though, with the chart context. now, mm -hmm. but it's not, I mean, the moves that it's in like a five year period before COVID, there were actually several times that it went up a very large amount and then sometimes went down quite a bit, at, not that long after, but because of how big the increase was in COVID now on the chart, it looks like nothing, but I'd say it happened three times in like five years. It's like a, a high flyer. It's trades like a semiconductor company sometimes. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty predictable over the long term. The revenue growth sometimes shoots up for brief periods, and obviously the gross margins change a lot. They had a really bad time, you know, when they have tried to go too much into one thing. Basically, they had what happened to them, what happened to Peloton. 
they're not in the situation Peloton is. You know, this is not one product company. It's not mm-hmm. in the financial situation that Peloton is. But if the same thing happened to them. They went all in on the idea that growth was continuing in something that just completely fell apart because it was driven all by COVID type stuff. So you have way too much inventory. Now, in their case, the inventory, a lot of it's held by other people. You know, we talked about with Peloton, that's hard to tell. When you grow this fast, it's very hard to know if it'll continue and um, how to manage things. So you end up with a lot of inventory that has yeah, someone has to get rid of it somehow. Mm-hmm. Perishable too, right? Yeah, they put a little date on it to tell you how fresh mm-hmm. it is. That, yeah. that was their big thing. Yeah, Everyone else is doing the same thing now, I think. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us. Uh, here today on the Focus Compounding Podcast. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Uh, if you're listening on Spotify, uh, please give us a uh, great review of five stars. That goes a long way for us. Uh, if you're listening on the iTunes side of things, uh, five stars also goes a long way for us. If you're interested in learning about our money management services, reach out to me, Andrew, at focusedcompounding.com. You could also go to our invest with us tab at focuscompounding.com. I want to thank everybody so much for all the support and we will see you in the next podcast.